And your microphone is off. Just making sure we don't have a feedback between. So welcome everyone. I am Stephen Miller. I'm going to be talking today about machine learning and elliptic curves and beyond from conjectures to theorem to conjectures. I want to thank the organizers for the invitation to come and speak today and for the previous speakers who have covered a lot of the background material, which allows me to focus on other things. I want to talk a little bit about the history of some of the subject and how we got to some of the problems we're looking at. And so unfortunately, many problems have painfully slow convergence. And for example, for elliptic curves, uh, a lot of the quantities converge at the rate of the log of the conductor. So even if you have millions of curves in your family, if the conductors are only size 10 to the 20, which to most of us is a large number, on a log scale that translates to something less than 50. And it's very dangerous to be making conjectures on primes if you only count primes up to 50. So there's a lot of improvements recently with computing power and the ability to look at large data sets. And I'm really excited to be talking to everyone today because I don't know that much about machine learning and I'm hoping to excite some of you in the audience to maybe look at some of these you know, unexplored areas or less explored areas in number theory, mathematical physics, where you might be able to sniff out some very interesting patterns. So I'm mostly gonna be talking about lower order terms. I'm gonna talk a little bit in the beginning from random matrix theory, then move to elliptic curves and just try to highlight a little bit of where might be good places to look, where might be good places to apply machine learning. And I'm gonna to try to emphasize the difference between when can we prove things and when can we only conjecture. And a lot of times we can only prove things when we are looking at very specific non-generic families. And I'm always extremely worried about making conjectures based on very carefully chosen examples. And this is why in some of the earlier talks today, I was really excited about where the machine learning fails. There's something interesting going on in those situations where different behavior is emerging. So I'd like to give the following as a warning to anybody working in subjects like So here is a claim which hopefully everybody knows is absurd. 40% of all integers are prime and 20 prime pair. So here is a sketch of a really bad group. Let's count all the primes up to 10. We see 2, 3, 5, 7. So 40% of the integers are prime and green 5 volts start to be prime pairs. If you doubt this, let's double the range of computation, go up to 20, and we see we gain the primes 11, 13, 17, and 19, where again two of them start to be prime pairs. Now, of course, we all realize this is absurd. I hope you will not get bored in the talk, but if you do, as a nice exercise, try to prove elementarily that the percentage of integers that are prime goes to zero. This is just to warn you about how careful we have to be when we're looking at numerical data and how essential it is to try to figure out what is the right scale to investigate things. And for elliptic curves, uh, there's a lot of phenomena that don't really emerge until we go very far, which is beyond the range of a lot of computations. So just your two other short notes. I am looking for collaborators. I work with a large number of students, undergraduates, graduate students, high school students. If anybody's interested in trying to pursue any of these questions, please let me know. Also, I am one of the managing editors of the Journal of Number Theory. We have both a general proof section as well as a section devoted just to computational number theory. So for anybody working in fields like this, if you have some papers, you know, please let me know. We would love to have papers on applications of machine learning to number theory. Okay, so I'm mostly going to be talking about you know two papers, one on random matrix ensembles, one on Dirichlet coefficients and elliptic curve families. Uh, and what I wanted to do is talk just very briefly on the history of the subject 
because not everybody has seen the connections from mathematical physics coming into number theory. So I like to say that you know I have you know, issues with my accent, not my Boston accent, you know, especially in Brazil right now, but with my accent of I learned number theory from an experimental nuclear physicist. And he was just sick and tired of having only on the order of 100 to 1,000 data points in nuclear physics. And when he discovered you could look at similar things in number theory and get billions of data points quickly, he was very excited. And so a lot of the insights in mathematical physics have a role to play in trying to figure out what should we look at in number theory. And so the classical three body problem is intractable. So I give you three points in general configuration under gravity. We can't talk about how the system evolves over time. So imagine how much worse it is with something like uranium, where you have over 200 protons and neutrons with a far worse force of interaction. Now you can get some information by shooting high energy neutrons into the nucleus and see what comes out. One of the best quotes I heard about this is imagine you want to understand how a grandfather clock works. So what you do is you take two grandfather clocks, accelerate them to about 99% the speed of light, and smack them into each other, look at all the stuff that flies out, and then try to deduce the internal structure of the grandfather clock from the record you see. We actually do a very similar calculation in number theory. And so one of my goals today is to try to show you how to recast a lot of what we're doing into the nuclear physics language. So what we're trying to solve is the fundamental equation is we have some operator H, the Hamiltonian, and we have the energy levels En, and we have the energy eigenfunctions. The problem is uh, this is an infinite by infinite matrix, so this is already more than you would see in a normal linear algebra class. And even worse, we don't know any of the entries of the matrix because it is so complicated. And so Wigner's great insight was to model this like we would with statistical mechanics. So rather than trying to write down the specific matrix for our system, look at a bunch of matrices that should have similar properties that will model whatever we know. Maybe there's time reversal symmetry, and that puts some constraints on what types of matrices you can look at. For each matrix, we can calculate what the distribution of energy levels are. And then what we can do is we can then average over all matrices, and the hope is that a general matrix will be close to the system average. And we see a lot of stuff like this in number theory in a lot of the families we're going to look at. And so I'm not gonna go through all the details. Um, I have put far more slides down here than I plan to go through in 50 minutes. So if anybody is interested, I know we have some time this afternoon and I can go through the calculations in much greater detail. But basically we write down a matrix. We say that the probability of choosing a matrix is the probability of choosing uh, each of the entries. Maybe the matrix is real symmetric. So AIJ is AJI. Maybe the matrix has other symmetries which will you know, further influence which entries are independent. And then we want to understand the eigenvalues of A. So the question is, how do we go from what we understand, the matrix elements, to what we want to understand, which is the eigenvalues? And so one way we can do this is we attach a measure. Since we have n eigenvalue, we put a mass of size 1 over n at each normalized eigenvalue. So that's why we take lambda i and divide by 2 root m. This is the quantity that scales nicely. And so this is the Dirac delta functional. If you then integrate from A to B, we'll tell you how many normalized eigenvalues we have in this region. We can calculate the kth moment. That's just integrating x to the k. And well, since x to the k is just going to give us lambda i over 2 root n to the kth power, we now have just the sum of the kth powers of the eigenvalues. But by the eigenvalue trace formula, that's the trace of A to the k. And so we can pass from knowledge of the moments of the lambdas to knowledge of the matrix coefficients or vice versa. And the hope is that as long as things are nice, if you know the moments, you know the distribution. This is true if you only have finitely many eigenvalues, and then you do some abstract nonsense to show that you know, something similar holds in the limit. But the idea is by understanding the matrix coefficients, we can understand the moments. By understanding the moments, we can understand the eigenvalues. And then the rest is just going through all the details. Um, you know, the key, as I said, was the eigenvalue trace lemma. And then you expand things out, and then you have to do some integrals, and then some interesting combinatorics arise. So I'm not going to go through the combinatorics now. I will just quickly remark that if you look at the trace of A squared, that's going to be the sum of the eigenvalues squared. It's going to be Aij, Aji, so it's the sum of Aji squared. Well, if you look at what's going on, if I choose my matrix elements to say independent, identically distributed random variables, mean zero, variance one, each Aij squared, if I take the expected value, that's just the variance. So we expect each one of these to be one. We have n squared entries. We expect this to be of size n squared. 
So the sum of the squares of the eigenvalues is of size n squared. I have n of them. So on average, I expect the eigenvalues to be of size square root of n. This tells me the correct scale in which I should be investigating. It tells me the correct scale for normalization. That's why we divided by two square roots of n early. And then the rest is just doing the combinatorics, which I will skip. And what I will go to is an interesting ensemble as my first example of places where machine learning might be able to say some really interesting things and you know, hope uh, to excite somebody. So the first is what I'll call the checkerboard ensemble. And I looked at this with some students a couple of years ago. And so everybody has played you know, checkers or chess with the standard alternating uh, squares every other. But it doesn't have to be every two. You could have a pattern every three, every four. The one below is every four. So every third element in this matrix, I have the same common value W. And then the other entries are independent, identically distributed random variables, subject to the constraint that the matrix is real symmetric. If the matrix is real symmetric, then the eigenvalues are real. It talks about, it makes sense to talk about ordering them and looking at spacings between adjacent eigenvalues. And so we can ask, you know, I have fewer degrees of freedom, but I still have on order of n squared degrees of freedom. And I can ask, how does the structure of the eigenvalues change if I put in this additional structure? So the big theorem that Vigna proved um, a little while ago, uh, good, I even jumped to the right side perfectly, uh, is that almost every matrix, as n goes to infinity, if you draw them from a nice distribution, is going to converge to the semicircle distribution. What does this mean? It means the spacings of normalized eigenvalues converges to a semicircle. I talked a moment ago about why we divide by square root of n. This is why we divide by two square root of n, so we can say semicircle and not semi-ellipse. And so most matrices will be very close to the semicircle. If we go to the checkerboard ensemble, we can then ask, what is the effect of this W going to be? I'm now looking at a subset of real symmetric matrices. How much of a change does this introduce? Well, here's a histogram of the normalized eigenvalues of a two checkerboard matrix. Um, I did 100 by 100 matrices, 100 trials, and almost all of the matrix eigenvalues are close and are following the semicircle, but there's a small little blip of a couple of eigenvalues that are outside. And as I let the size of my matrix grow, you can see that the proportion of eigenvalues that are escaping the semicircle is getting smaller and smaller and smaller, and it's actually moving further and further down. As so we keep going like this, and it gets you know, very few of them melted to the rest. Um, we can even bound how many there are. And if you want to prove things theoretically, you know, this is really nice because they're so well separated. It turns out most of the eigenvalues of size screw root of n. And in the number of eigenvalues that are not, it's roughly of size k, where k was the spacing in my checkerboard matrix. And they're going to be of size n. So much larger size, even though there's very few of them. Unfortunately, because they're all of size n, even though there's very few of them, if we try to do a method of moments to understand the eigenvalues, those few eigenvalues that are large completely drown out the moments and eliminate all knowledge of what's going on inside. So we need other techniques. Uh, one of the big techniques is localization. And so we use a weighting function. And what we can do is we can make it uh, non-negative and we can make it one near one, and then zero near zero. And then what happens is, as we let the matrix elements you know, grow, we can normalize it so that most of the eigenvalues we divide by and they're now gonna be very close to zero. And then those few that are escaping will be close to one. And so when we look at it like this, the ones near zero will be roughly of size one over square root of n. There's gonna be almost no way to attach them. So by using something like this, I can focus my analysis theoretically on those few eigenvalues that are escaping. And by using a different weight function, I could of course focus on what's going on near zero and get rid of these last ones. Um, looking at just you know, what happens, you can see uh, this is a really nice weighting function to use, very easy to work with. As I let the exponent n grow rapidly, you can see it's becoming very much of a spike just near one and just localizing. And so this is a beautiful picture in terms of looking at what happens for those eigenvalues that are at the extreme end. There's a wonderful structure. And as the size of the checkerboard is getting larger and larger and larger, it's actually converging to the semicircle. There's a whole family that these actually agree with. There's a lot going on here. There's too much in a short talk right now, but there's an incredible amount of structure in these eigenvalues that were initially causing some trouble. 
And what I'm hoping is that there are other ensembles of matrices that we can look at. It might be interesting to try to see, can you find some techniques to maybe classify certain eigenvalues as being part of a different structure? You know, you don't need to have too much knowledge when you're looking at a picture like this to see that there's two regions. We saw some cluster analysis earlier of trying to identify where do we put things. And so because I'm not an expert in the subject, I do classifications where it is really blatantly obvious and I can just glance down and say, these are the bulk eigenvalues, these are the few exceptions. The difficulty, of course, is when the regions interact and we have the meeting and then trying to figure out how do we correctly classify. And so I know how to do it in this case. I'm hoping to excite people to try to look at something different. Okay, we've heard um, a couple of talks on L functions. I'm not sure what everybody's background is, so I will just quickly do a few mandatory slides on L functions just to make sure we're all on the same page. Uh, the Riemann zeta function is the prototypical. It's defined as the sum over all of the integers of one over n to the s. And by unique factorization, it turns out that this is also expressible as a product over primes. Okay, uh, there's a lot of connections between the zeta function and pi of x, which counts how many primes are there at most x. Uh, my two you know, favorite examples, if you look as s goes to one, this gives you a proof that there are infinitely many primes because we know the harmonic series one over n diverges. And if there were only finitely many primes, the product would be finite. A more interesting one is a special value proof. If you take s equals two, zeta of two is pi squared over six, pi squared is irrational. If there were only finitely many primes, then the product would have to be rational at s equals two. But we know pi squared is irrational, thus there must be infinitely many primes. So there's a lot of information encoded in the values of the zeta function at special points. And in some of the talks earlier, when we were doing, when we were hearing about classifications and ones that were being missed, I was quite curious to see what's going on maybe with the values of the L functions at one or whatever, however you normalize your central point. Uh, the Riemann zeta function satisfies a functional equation when you put in a couple of gamma factors relating its values at s to values of one minus s. The Riemann hypothesis states that all of these uh, non-trivial zeros have real part of one half. So there are trivial zeros of the negative even integers coming from the gamma function. And all the other ones we can write as one half plus i gamma. And if the Riemann hypothesis is true, we can then talk about gaps between adjacent eigenvalues. And there's a lot of similarity now between this and nuclear physics, where we can talk about spacings between energy levels. If the Riemann hypothesis is false, we can no longer order the zeros of the zeta function. We no longer have connections like this. You can still do the calculations, but you miss a lot of the interpretations. The wonderful observation is that it looks like the gaps between zeros look a lot like the eigenvalues between complex emission matrices, and between a lot of the things we see, modules and symmetry types in nuclear physics, that you're seeing the same phenomena in many different places. Now, of course, instead of looking at the Riemann zeta function, we can more generally look at an L function. Now, I can't, well, I could put just anything I would want for my coefficients AF of n, and I can define a series, and you know, as long as the AFs don't grow too rapidly, the series will converge. And then there's a whole school as to what do we consider an L function. And so typically we want the L function to have some kind of product expression. So I want to be able to write it as a product over primes. And I'll show you in a little bit why this is so crucial for all the theoretical investigations. Uh, in many situations, it will also satisfy a function equation. We also believe that it will satisfy the generalized Riemann hypothesis. And we also believe that the spacings between the zeros should be similar to what we've been seeing before. Uh, a great source of uh, examples for L functions come from elliptic curves. One of the nice things about being a postdoc at Brown is Joe Silverman was kind enough to give me the images from his book. So, you know, if you've read any of his books on you know, arithmetic of elliptic curves, you probably recognize these pictures. So if we look at curves of the form y squared is x cubed plus ax plus b, where a and b are integers, we can ask, you know, if I fix a and b, what integer pairs x and y will satisfy this relation? And it turns out that you can put a group law on such. So if P and Q are two such points, then the way we add P and Q is you draw the line connecting them and that intersects the curve in one more point. You can show that we'll call that point R. And it turns out that if you reflect that about the X axis, that's how we should define P plus Q. So there's a nice group law going on here. And you can ask, what is the structure of that group? And it turns out this group has a finite part, the torsion part, points of finite order. And then it's, 
some number of copies of Z. And it's very interesting to ask what are the possible values of R? This is the geometric range of the elliptic curve. Uh, in one of the talks yesterday, we heard that you know, the largest today is 28. There were some conjectures that uh, it's now believed in a lot of models that there will not be many more curves with length greater than 28. Maybe around 32 might be the highest you can get. I'm um, forget exactly how far they believe it can go now. And what we can do is it 46? Okay, I, I don't know how uh, some finite uh, from the uh, Tony in the audience was saying he believes it's now in the 40s. As long as it's less than my age, I feel, I feel old. So how can we build an L function? Well, let's let A E P denote how many pairs of X and Y mod P do we have that satisfy the relation mod P. And as a rough heuristic, what you could say is, well, look, if I choose X, if what I have is a perfect square, I should have two values of y that work, you know, the square root of mod p and the negative square root of mod p, unless it happens to be zero, in which case I only have one y that works. And maybe half the time it's a square, half the time it's not a square. So if you do that simple heuristic, you would expect I have um, p choices for x, half the time I get two y's, half the time I get zero. I expect maybe there should be p values of x, y that work. So let's look at p minus the number of pairs that work. Just take what you expect to be the answer and subtract from that. This is a good way to look at the fluctuations. And those will be our coefficients of an elliptic curve. And it turns out that this has beautiful formulas. We can write it as a product of the primes. And then the Birchins Winnerton Dye conjecture states that the group of rational solutions, the R that I was talking about, the number of copies of Z that we have, the geometric rank, is equal to the order of vanishing of this L function at S equals one half. So this is one of the biggest problems right now in the subject. This is uh, one of the clay millennial problems is you know, trying to prove this relation between this geometric object and this analytic object. Okay, so there's a lot of reasons why we care about um, zeros of L functions. I'm not gonna go through them now. This is all for later if people have questions. I promise to try to show some connections between mathematical physics and number theory, as well as why we care so much about the product form. And so if we can write our L functions as a product, I'll use the zeta function as an example. Well, in complex analysis, one of the Pavlovian responses we have whenever we see a function is take its logarithmic derivative that will get you f prime over f, do a contour integral. So if we do that to the zeta function, well, the log of a product is the same as the sum of the logs. If we try to differentiate, we try to do the logarithmic derivative of the infinite sum expansion, that would be a nightmare. But by taking the log of a product and taking the derivative, that's now just the derivative of the sum of the logs. We expand the denominator using the geometric series formula. And as long as the real part of S is sufficiently large, this can all be justified. And the remaining piece is a easily understood piece. The main term comes from the first term in expanding the geometric series. And now we do our contour integral. We integrate over, say, the real part of S equals two. And then we shift the contour. And as we shift the contour, we get a contribution every time we pass a zero or a pull. And so instead of just integrating zeta prime over zeta, we could hit it by x to the s over s. And this is how you would prove the prime number for now. But of course, we don't have to hit it by x to the s over s. We could hit it by some more general test function phi. And this is playing the role of the neutron from nuclear physics, and I'll talk more about that later. And now on the right-hand side, we now have the integral of phi of s times p to the minus s. Well, I can write p as e to the negative i log p, and what we now really have is a Fourier transform on the right-hand side. So this relates, the left-hand side is a weighted sum of the zeros you know, with my test function phi, and on the right-hand side, it's a sum weighted by the coefficients of the L function, in this case, they're all one because it's the zeta function, times the Fourier transform of phi. And so you get explicit formulas like this. This is the explicit formula for a Dirichlet L function. The left-hand side is a sum over the zeros. I'm assuming the Riemann hypothesis so they're all in the form one half plus I gamma. And in the right-hand side, you have a sum over primes, then sum over prime squares, prime cubes, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The sums over the higher powers of the primes turn out to be a lower order term. Uh, we have this fact of the log m coming from the conductor from the functional equation. Once you get to p cubed, the coefficients are growing at such a rate 
and then we have higher powers in the denominator that everything converges. For the primes and the primes squared, however, those can and actually do contribute. So the higher moments of the families only contribute to the lower order terms. Okay. So I want to talk briefly about the cat sonic conjecture to try to understand what's going on in the central point. And this will motivate why I'm so interested in trying to find biases in some of these families of elliptic curves and where I think machine learning can play an interesting role in trying to sniff out what's really going on. Because the only cases I can analyze are the very artificial cases where I have deliberately stacked the deck in my favor by choosing families I can work with. So, the following is a plot of 70 million adjacent zeros of the Riemann zeta function due to a LISCO comparing what you would expect with random matrix theory. And you see an almost perfect agreement in terms of just how great of a job it's doing in terms of predicting what's going on. Well, this is what's going on very far from the central point. So you've gone far enough away that the limiting behavior uh, has kicked in. Uh, I don't want to turn this into a theoretical talk on zeros near the central point, I'll just say that if you go far from the central point, all families behave similarly. But if you look near the central point, different curves behave differently. The number of zeros, average spacing if you had height t is about one over log t. So the further up you go, the more zeros you have in an interval of size one. That means one L function provides you sufficiently many points to average over if you go high up. If you're near the central point, however, you only have a couple of zeros, and so you no longer have enough to get some kind of nice limiting behavior. So the cat sonic idea was to look at a family of L functions. Maybe look at all elliptic curves where you have some fixed polynomials A of T, B of T. We'll look at all Dirichlet characters of a given conductor. We'll look at all cuspidal new forms of a given level and weight. And average over all of them, and then get some idea of what's going on on average near the central point. So we won't be able to prove things like the Birch and Swinton Dye conjecture, but I can prove in many situations, if you give me a family that has four zeros at the central point, it looks like, I'm sorry, if you give me a family of rank four, it looks like there are four zeros at the central point. They may not be at the central point, they may be infinitesimally above or below, which would, of course, violate the Birch and Dye conjecture, but on average, it looks like they have the right number of zeros. So there's a lot of statistics. I'm not gonna go into the statistics, um, if anybody wants, again, I'm happy to talk about that later. The cat sonic idea was to look at the n-level density. And so you take a Schwartz test function, uh, we'll use g this time, and what you do is you multiply uh, the zeros, uh, I'm sorry, you evaluate the test function at the zeros, and what's nice about this is because g is Schwartz, the further away you go, the less contribution you get. So this is a statistic that is very sensitive to what's going on at the central point. And by the Birch Winnerton Dye conjecture, at least for the curves, this is a place where we believe a lot of action is happening. Unfortunately, we can't get information from this by doing an analysis for just one L function. So we have to average over a family. And so the conjecture is that when you do these averages, what you see is exactly what you would get if you looked at different families of matrices. And the examples I gave earlier were the matrices physicists started to look at. We actually look now at matrices coming from the classical compact groups. There is a natural choice of randomness. You use the harm measure. And so you look at unitary matrices, orthogonal matrices, symplectic matrices. And it turns out that different families of L functions are associated to different families of uh, classical compact groups. And there's a way to try to figure out what that association should be. I don't want to go into too much detail. Um, you can always can talk about that later. The main thing is, it's just the first two moments that really matter. When you calculate things, when you're doing the explicit formula, the higher moments come in as lower order terms. And the reason is, if you look at what's going on, the first moment has like a one over square root of p. The second moment has one over p. And then the next one has one over p to the three halves. Once you get a one over p to the three halves, that converges. It's dominated by one over n to the three halves, that's a P series from calculus, which is really bad notation because P here cross means primes, but this is the P series from calculus that you know converges. The one over root P, one over P, those could diverge and that's where the contributions come from. What's going on is really very similar to the central limit theorem. And so what you have is similar to the central limit theorem. If I give you any nice distribution, I can always adjust it so it has mean zero. I can then always rescale so that it has variance one. 
And if you know about like the very essence theorem, it's the low, higher moments, the third moment, the fourth moment, that affect the rate of convergence to normality. The same thing is going on here for these families of L functions. We have a universality in the first two moments you know, in terms of what the possibilities are. The higher moments, that's where the arithmetic of the family comes into play. That's what affects the rates of convergence. And for a lot of the numerical experiments, a lot of the data, this could be impacting a little bit of what's going on. Uh, I just wanted to, I just added these slides after Matilda's talk yesterday, because uh, you know some of the formulas he was mentioning are actually similar to some of the things I saw a couple of years ago. I was trying to look at lower order terms in some of these families and trying to find you know, what's the best way to average. And so the lambdas are basically my coefficients of my L functions. I'm allowing myself to put in some weights. SFP is going to be the set of primes that don't divide the conductor. You know, your conductor won't have too many of these, but unfortunately, small primes can be the source of most of the contribution. So these calculations become very delicate. You can't just throw away finitely many primes because the primes two and three are often the biggest source of what's going on. And I can now try to calculate, and I'll call the auth moment just calculating the weighted value of the auth power of the coefficients. And then you get a nice expansion where the first couple of terms only involve the zero first and second moments. And then the last term involves something that looks a lot like you know, a third moment. Um, you, know, you can play some games and you can replace it with equation 1.15, which is you know, very similar to, uh, if you look at 1.14, you know, some of the sums that we were seeing yesterday in terms of what is the denominator, what is the numerator, it looks a lot like stuff like that. And so some of these lower order terms, there might be some interesting experiments you can do in terms of trying to sniff out behavior in what's going on here. Um, I promised a dictionary to convert from my physics accent to my math accent. So here is how I view of these things. So the zeros of my L functions correspond to the energy levels in nuclear physics. In nuclear physics, we shoot in a Schwartz, I'm sorry, we shoot in a neutron and we see what comes out. The analog in number theory is we shoot in a Schwartz test function and we evaluate these sums. In nuclear physics, we would love to shoot a neutron of arbitrary energy, but we can't. We can only shoot neutrons with a given band whose energy lies in a given band. And from that partial information, we try to deduce what's going on. Ideally, we'd shoot in anything. But we have the same constraints on the number theory side. We'd love to shoot in an arbitrary Schwartz test function. Yeah, I'd love to shoot something that's converging to a delta spike at zero, then I could prove the Birch when it's a diaconjunct, because it would only detect what's going on at the central point. Unfortunately, we have the uncertainty principle at play. The more you know the function, the less you know its Fourier transform. And it turns out that it's the support of the Fourier transform has to be suitably restricted. This is the analog of the number theory. This is the number theory analog of the nuclear physics problem. So this is a little bit of motivation as to why we care about some of these problems. I want to now talk about the bias conjecture. So I have made this conjecture back when I was a grad student. Um, I was impressed about how careful I was in making it to cover my ass. And so it has not yet been disproved. I would love to see um, either a proof, just proof, some more non-trivial non examples. So what is it? So let's take a one parameter family of elliptic curves. So I give you two polynomials, A of T, B of T with integer coefficients. And for each specialization of capital T to an integer, I get an elliptic curve. I can calculate what the rank is. I can calculate what the group structure is. I can calculate the value of the L function at the single point. I can calculate this. I can do all these calculations for a given curve. And what I want to know is I want to try to understand the behavior of the family. And so I'll define this before the off moment. I'm not going to normalize by dividing by the number of terms. I'm just going to take the coefficients of my elliptic curve to the off power. This is a talk, so I'm not going to do the calculations in too much detail or too carefully. You have to be extremely careful because everybody normalizes differently. So most of the time, we normalize things in L functions so that the functional equation goes from 0 to 1. But if you do elliptic curve, sometimes the literature goes from 0 to 2. And you think things could be of size square root of p rather than of size one. My quantities here are of size square root of p. Okay. And so it turns out that the moments are related to a lot of interesting properties of the elliptic curves. So the first is the first moment is related to the rank of the elliptic surface, the rank of the family over q of t. 
So now instead of looking at solutions with X and Y being integers, let's consider my family and let's look for polynomials X of T, Y of T that solve this relation. And you know, what would be the group in that situation? And so what Mike Rosen and Joe Silverman proved is that if Tate's conjecture holds, which holds if your elliptic uh, surface has certain properties, if it's a rational elliptic surface, this is known, then this weighted sum of the first moment actually gives you the rank. What you can do then is if you can actually jerry-rig a family of elliptic curves where you can calculate the first moment, you can then actually use this to prove that the family has to have that as its rank. And so I actually was able to do that in, in certain circumstances. Uh, the next is the second moment. And so Michelle proved that as long as G of T is non-constant, then the second moment is P squared with a correction of size P to three halves. And this cool with the logical interpretations for the different factors of size P to three halves, P, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so in every family study before July, 2023, and uh, some people in the audience might recognize some of these slides from an ISOM workshop, uh, every family we looked at, the first lower order term that did not average to zero on average was negative. And so that was the conjecture I made back when I was a grad student, that the first term which does not average to zero is on average negative. This is not saying that for every prime, the first term that doesn't average to zero is going to be negative. It's just as you somehow average over the primes, you will still have a negative bias. All right, so why do we care about this? It turns out that this is related to excess rank. So if you look at a lot of families of elliptic curves, it was conjectured that if your family has rank R over Q of T, then maybe in the limit, half the time you should be ranked R, half the time you should be ranked R plus one for generic families. This was not observed. A lot of times we were observing about 32% had rank R, about 18% had rank R plus two. Mark Watkins finally went far enough to see that 18% drop. And so it turns out that if, if there is a bias in the second moment, that does explain a little bit of why you see this graph. It's a very small effect, but the effect is there. Wow. And so just what's going on is when you look at the explicit formula, when you look at the sums, uh, we have a sum over the prime squareds, and the sum of the second moment, it is a small negative bias over there, it gives you a small little boost. So again, that was my motivation for why I wanted to look at this, to try to understand a very small amount of why uh, we were seeing more rank than expected. All right, so let me talk about um, how we do stuff like this. So the main tool is the fact that for elliptic curves, we can actually write down explicitly what the coefficients are by using the Legendre symbol. So the Legendre symbol x on p is defined to be one if x is a non-zero square mod p, zero if x is zero mod p, and negative one other one. So this is a nice way to count, and it turns out this quantity A that I defined earlier, there was you know, P minus the number of solutions, that just turns out to be the sum of the Legendre symbol as X ranges mod P. So for your fixed value of T, all I have to do is calculate the sum, and I will know what the coefficient is. Unfortunately, these sums are difficult to calculate. You can show that in absolute value to the most two square roots of P, but to evaluate in general is extremely difficult. Now, if we had a linear or quadratic Legendre sum, then the answer would be very different. Those can be evaluated in closed form very simply. I'm going to just you know, write down what the results are over here. But once you get to a cubic, which is what you would have to understand from an elliptic curve, you're in trouble. And so uh, the average value of x on p, if x is not a prime, is typically going to be zero. And so that will simplify a lot of calculations. So I'm not going to go through all the details. You know, again, if you're interested, um, they're in the appendix. I'm happy to chat. You can use this very similar to the first talk today to construct things very carefully by choosing all your polynomials so that everything matches. And I can force six points to be on this family by playing games with the discriminant and deliberately choosing things so that I have a Legendre sum uh, for the first moment, sum on x, sum on t. Well, the only thing we know how to do for multivariable calculus, and we've heard about cap three already today, I guess there's two things. We can find maximum minima by using the branch multipliers, and we can switch the order of integration. And so if we switch the order, if we do things very carefully so that we have quadratics in T, we can execute those sums, and then the resulting X sum is no longer actually going to be a cubic. Things have simplified. We'll have like an X squared that will come out. Well, if I want to know what is X squared on P, that's very easy. X squared is going to be a square as long as it's not zero. 
So that's the one minute introduction as to how those calculations work. So let me just end by talking a little bit about some of the one parameter families in the bias and where I think machine learning has a big role to play. So below is a collection of a bunch of families I looked at in the first moment and the second moment. So all of these families satisfy Tate's conjecture, the most Silverman family is applicable. The first have rank zero, the next has rank one, the next two have rank two. Uh, N32 P is the number of cube roots of two mod P. So if you look at um, the Y squared is X cubed plus T X squared plus one, um, I'm sorry, yes, there's a term over here, P three halves P, oh sorry, C three halves P. And when I look at what that is over here, that term is of size P to the three halves. You know, four X cubed plus one on P, sum of X mod P, that's actually the coefficient of an elliptic curve with complex multiplication. That's gonna be zero half the time and of size screw root of P the other half of the time. So Michelle's theorem is actually sharp. You really can't have terms of size P to the three halves. Every family I've been able to analyze nicely um, always has a term of size P to the three halves that averages to zero. The problem is unlike the random matrix example, which I showed you earlier with the checkerboard matrix where we had a couple of eigenvalues that were well separated from everything else. Unfortunately, the term of size P to the three halves dwarfs the P and the square root of P those other terms. And it's those terms that I believe are having these lower order biases that I would love to sniff out, but you have this incredible noise that's masking everything that's making it difficult. And so I'm really hoping somebody here who's an expert in machine learning might be able to find ways to see what's going on. So again, if it's a quadratic, if it's a linear sum, we know how to do those. That's always gonna be a mantra to try to look at things where we can execute these sums. And so we can do this in many situations. Unfortunately, these are no longer generic families of elliptic curves. So I would love to team up with somebody and do a really good systematic exploration of families where we cannot write things down in closed form and see what's going on. Do we still think that this bias is happening or could this bias be because these are very special families? The degrees of my polynomial are not that far. I warned everybody about making conjectures on primes by only going up to 20 or 50. Maybe we're not looking at generic enough families to really see what's going on. So just to give you a feel for the calculations, if I give you the following family, if I want to calculate the first sum, the first moment, I have a double sum. I sum t mod p, I sum x mod p. And when I'm looking at this, if x is either equal to zero or negative one, then the t sum is zero because the coefficient funnel t vanishes and the other term is just zero. Otherwise, I can just change variables and send t to x inverse x minus one inverse t and then I have a linear Legendre sum and that sum is going to vanish. So this is how you do the first moment sum. The second moment sum is a little bit more involved. I now have three sums and then you just you know, play some games, you move things around a little bit. And what's really nice is you know, I chose things very carefully so that I have a quadratic T sum that I evaluate first. And when I do that quadratic T sum, it turns out it's going to be P minus one if X equals Y and negative one otherwise. And then that's going to leave me with very simple quadratic sums in X and Y outputs. And so I can evaluate these in nice closed forms. I can calculate the second moment for this family. Uh, here is a little bit more interesting family. You know, again, we can do this simple calculation. Um, and you know, it turns out the rank is going to be one. The second moment calculation is a little bit worse. I'm not gonna go through that. Um, that's, one of the things I did in my thesis in graduate school is I just calculated all of these things for so many families. So for the rest of my life, I can just refer to my thesis for the detailed calculations. So back in 2014, I had a group of students and we were looking at lots of curves of the form P of X, T plus Q of X, where P and Q have a degree at most three. We got you know, really nice formulas, which we were able to solve in some cases. And you know, in the uh, gave a talk yesterday, uh, he and one of his colleagues were able to prove the bias conjecture holds for all of these families. So you know, at least there's now a large class of families where the bias conjecture is known to hold. But again, these are very special families. You know, it's gotta be of this form. It's only linear in T. I think in the interest of time, I'll skip this family and I'll go straight to the family. Y squared is X cubed plus X plus T cubed. And so this is work I did with some students uh, this past summer. And so there's a beautiful quote by Ernest Rutherford. If your experiment needs statistics, you ought to have done a better experiment. 
And so the idea was your data should be so overwhelmingly you know, convincing as to what's going on that there's no need to resort to you know, anything to try to justify it. you've seen something. The problem, of course, is as we're seeing in the 21st century, there's so much data out there now that it's very difficult sometimes to see some of these effects when they're being masked by a lot of things. You know, you're nuclear physicists, you at CERN, you're trying to smash and detect these subatomic particles, you know, have tremendous challenges with you know, terabytes of data that they're going through trying to look for very small effects. And the question is, can we see similar stuff here in number theory? So here are uh, two very similar data sets. The first is you know, random biases with mean zero. The other is random biases with mean negative 110. I debated showing you these pictures without actually having the labels of zero and negative 110 to see. Can you actually detect a slight difference? Or better yet, not shifting every point by negative 110 and just giving you two data sets drawn slightly differently to see, can you see the difference? Well, sometimes you know, the experiment is so obvious you really do not need statistics. That's where I'm good. So when it's really blatant, like the checkerboard matrix, where you can see the eigenvalues are off to the side, it's really clear what's going on. The second one I'm going to show you, and I'm going to see if you can detect a pattern. Right, so is everybody ready? If you see the pattern, I guess I'll just do it for the people who won't shut up if you see the pattern. Anything clear here? Any points seem to have any nice structure to them? So this is really obvious. There's this whole class of points that seem to have some common behavior. And with a little bit of analysis, it's very quick to see that these are coming from the primes that are 2 mod 3. Now, I'm looking at the bias. How do I calculate the bias? I look at the second moment, and I believe the second moment is of size p squared. Michelle proved that the main term is of size p squared. So we subtract off the known main term of size p squared. The fluctuations can be of size p to the 3 halves. We divide by p to the 3 halves. Now, if there is a term of size p to the 3 halves, then this quantity should be roughly on the order of 1. Unfortunately, if there's a lower order term in the second moment of size p, when I divide by p to the 3 halves, it gives me something of size 1 over square root of p, which is going to 0. So even if the bias is there, it's going to be much smaller than the fluctuating p to the 3 halves term, and it's going to be very hard to see. Now, what's interesting is when my students were looking at this, they detected that this family has a positive bias for the primes that are 2 mod 3. Now, my bias conjecture, which I said was open until July 2023, was that every family you look at, on average, will have a negative bias. So I was very careful. I covered myself, even though it fails for half the prime. So when you look at all the primes, it should be negative. So when you look at the curve on the, the, the plot on the left, it's not clear at all to me that there's enough of a bias there to overwhelm the bias from the primes that are too much. And again, because I'm presenting on this, it has to be a special family where I can do the calculations. So for the primes that are 2 mod 3, uh, we can actually write down exactly what the second moment is. It's p squared plus p. And the reason is that if p is 2 mod 3, we have a nice automorphism. t cubed to t uh, for primes that are 2 mod 3 is an automorphism that allows me to reduce the degree of the polynomials. We can do the calculations. Everything becomes very nice. There is no nice closed form expression uh, for what is going on when the primes are 1 mod 3. The conference at ISOM was wonderful. I'm talking to some of the people there who have some ideas of how to use some really powerful techniques from algebraic geometry to try to get some sense of what's going on for the primes that are 1 mod 3, but you know, no full answer has been extracted yet. And so again, just looking at it like this, it's really hard to see if there's going to be enough of a bias in the primes that are 1 mod 3 to overwhelm the primes that are 2 mod 3. So one of the things we started to look at was, you know, Let's look at uh, the negative bias for the primes that are 1 mod 3. Let's look at a running average. And so when we look at the running average, it's very quickly stabilizing. And it does look like there is a bit of a negative bias for the primes that are 1 mod 3. When we then look at the running average of everything, it does look like there is a small negative bias, although the running average does become positive for some small amount of time. But most of the time, the running average does seem to be negative. So this is definitely an interesting family. Something is going on here. We do not have proofs. 
we have, you know, that this might be worth looking at. And so, you know, is there a way to determine a formula for the primes that are one log three? So going back uh, towards the very beginning, I think it was somewhere, oh, hit the right button, excellent. This is why I always use Darmstadt for my slides because you can just click on the circle. If you look at what's going on here, there are nice formulas for the second moment. You know, these are either polynomials or polynomials times very nice functions. And these functions often involve coefficients or sums of coefficients of low order forms. So you know, again, I'm excited about this workshop in terms of trying to make more collaborations. There could be some wonderful projects in terms of looking at a bunch of families and seeing, can you do some machine learning techniques and try to find formulas for these low order terms? formulas for the second moment. Now for two of the families, you might notice that there's a split for what the second moment is, depending on whether or not the prime is two or one log three. These are families with complex multiplication. Uh, things are slightly different in those cases. Um, there are other formulas where if you look at negative three on P, that's going to just depend on what is P congruent to odd uh, various you know, specific fixed primes. So maybe if you look at things mod, six mod 24, maybe 72, something like that, some number of powers of two, some number of powers of three, split it up into a bunch of classes like that, then all of these special factors will have a fixed value in that congruence class. And maybe it will reduce to a nice polynomial. So by splitting into different congruence classes, we do have the opportunity of stitching together a bunch of polynomials. And so if anybody is interested, I think it would be fascinating to try to figure out how do we split the primes to try to get maybe some interesting behavior, look at some non-generic families where we can't just write down what the answer is, where we can't evaluate the Legendre sums because we no longer have anything that's you know, so nice. And so, you know, is there a formula for the primes one more three? What happens in a generic family? You know, in a generic family where we can no longer use these Legendre sums, do we still expect the bias conjecture to hold or is this really a result of looking at low values? So just a couple of references. Uh, these are just you know, some of the papers I've mentioned. You know, there's a lot more than this going on. So, oh, we got it. Yeah. Thank you so much. Maybe you have a look at the chat box. Oh, yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, you have this thing in the in the right? Yes. Um, I'm, I'm assuming the polynomials. Um, I'm sorry. Yes. I'm assuming the polynomials. Yes. I mean, so, so if you want to be in a situation where you, so the question was, what happens if you play with the degrees of A of T and B of T? So if the degrees of A and T and B of T, you know, if they get greater than four, you're definitely not going to be a rational surface. And there's a nice condition in terms of what the degree of A and T must be right. in terms of the discriminant, like three and four, something like that, to force it to still be a rational surface where Tate's conjecture is known. We do expect a lot of these results to hold to greater generality. But it could be that a rational surface is a very special type of surface and it's not generic. So maybe if we look at non rational surfaces uh, where we still expect uh, the first moment to work, maybe that might affect the bias. Well, yes, yes. But you know, again, um, I'm not too worried about doing anything like that theoretically because the degrees of A or B have to be so large that I have no chance of doing any Legendre sum calculations. So, what happens? Oh, I assume they're wrong. Um, and we can't do it clearing denominators? Right. But, but I'm saying, can I, can I just play some games and just you know change what X and Y are to fit in? Um, 
Because you know, we, we never assume you know A and B are rational numbers. We can always clear the denominators. Right. I, I think you can do some kind of transformation like that and just clear the denominators. And so I think it's sufficient to just study A and B in integers. It'll change. It'll change, a, it'll change a little bit, but 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 really you should be able to do your up to finally many exceptions. You should be able to clear the denominators by you know, sending y to y over this and x to x over this. The P equals two can be a significant contribution. Yeah, but if you look at the then E, right? E is not a fairly quick. So you are looking at the well, I mean, if, it, if I'm looking at the bias conjecture, I don't care about what's going on for just one time. Right. But if I'm looking at um, trying to understand, say, zeros of an elliptic curve near the central point, that's where, using the explicit formula, I, I pass from sums of my test function at the zeros to sums of the Fourier transform weighted by the coefficients. And in that situation, when I'm looking at sums of the Fourier transform weighted by the coefficients, then I have these sums over primes of the first moment, second moment, third moment, fourth moment. And the higher moments, you're very similar to the very essence theorem, very similar to the central limit theorem, the higher moments contribute a lower order term. But that's exactly what we're looking at now. And so the prime two could actually be the biggest contributor to the lower order term. And when you look at these expansions here, you know, I have a sum over you know, the cubes and the fourth powers and the fifth powers, those sums will converge. But a good amount of those could be coming from the prime two. And so in this setting, when I'm looking at what's going on near the central point, those, I, I can't throw away any primes. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, I, I, I see what you're saying. Yes, I'm, I'm assuming that the elliptic curve is not bad too. Yes, you're right, you're right. So it, it could be interesting to look at um, an elliptic curve. Is you know is usually a one a three as well, right? Yes, and again, for, from a computational point of view, we often convert those to Weierstrass forms. But there could be some curves that cannot be converted to a form like this. Yeah. And whether you want to change yes. Things. Yes. 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 But that, that that's a great thing to investigate. Yes. Because uh, then I can use the Legendre form to state. It. Yes. Uh, I'm going to just come over to your screen because I don't want to miss. So, so, th so this was a probability question of in drawing a normal diagram. Has there ever been any uh, work done in terms of trying to figure out this, how close? Mm -hmm. Uh, how, how close to the normal it is. Um, I mean, what, what I've typically heard is you're very similar to you know, when Moses came down from Mount Sinai and he had the Ten Commandments. There was another one that said, you know, "Thou shalt have at least thirty data points," and with you know n equals thirty, you can basically assume it's close to normal. Uh, depending on which distribution you have, uh, will affect how close it is to normal. And so for a lot of distributions, if the distribution is symmetric, the third moment will vanish. And then it's the fourth moment that will be the first moment that starts to show you the shape of the elliptic curve. I mean, this is the shape of the uh, approximation to the normal distribution. So the question was, you know, uh, what's been done about how close you are when you're converging to normal? Um, the proof that I like most for the central limit theorem is using the characteristic function or the Fourier transform the same thing, it's just, you know, which terminology do you use? And what happens is when you look at the standardized density, where you subtract off the mean and you rescale so that the standard deviation is one and you take the limit, you have the characteristic function is converging to the characteristic function of the standard normal. And you can bound the deviations in the characteristic function 
in terms of the fourth moment and the higher moments. And if you wanted to convert from this to bounding deviations of probability, uh, instead of looking at two densities, I'm looking at two Fourier transforms of densities. And you can just go back and forth between knowledge of those. I don't know the explicit things. This is where you would look up uh, the Berry SN formula, V E R R Y, and then SN is E S S E N. That is, I think, explicit bounds on how close you are as a function of the third and the fourth moment. Thank you. Maybe you can start with more words. Okay. Thank you again. So, we will have to go on and out to the center. We will have to take the audience.